Welcome everybody to our class today. The topic is essential oils for trauma and grief. My name is Elisa Bonet. I am a certified essential oil educator and a wellness advocate with doTERRA. Today I'll be sharing a topic that's very close to my heart and it might be for you as well because we've all gone through some type of trauma in our life or grief and I hope that the information I share with you today will give you some insight as to how to process some of these difficult emotions and things that you can do to help yourself and support yourself. Or if you know of others that are going through a difficult time, maybe some of the suggestions I offer will be of service to them. Now, I'm not a doctor and what I'm gonna be sharing with you is from my personal experience, I have gone through a lot of death in my family, my mother, my father, aunts and uncles and cousins. And then I lost my older sister in 2012. And then my other uh, sister just a, a few weeks ago. So I thought this was an appropriate topic to cover because the, the current situation of the pandemic can affect a lot of lives as well. There has been a lot of death surrounding the circumstances that we find ourselves in. So this is a topic that I think would be helpful to acknowledge and just hopefully glean some information that can be supportive of the pain that this can cause. But before I, I jump into that, I do want to cover some basics of essential oils because I do use, of course, oils to support emotions and health. And for some of you that might be visiting today or are not familiar with oils, I'm going to give you just a really quick three minute rundown of what oils are and how we can use them for our health. Now, I do have a class that's more extensive on essential oils on my YouTube channel, and I'll be linking that in the recording. It's called Essential Oils Made Easy. And these are some of the takeaways from that class. Now, the first thing is that essential oils, if you use a very high quality brand, they're going to be completely pure and natural and safe. And they're plant extracts that are either distilled or cold pressed. And so the brand that I use is doTERRA. And these are certified pure tested grade, which makes them beyond organic. So there's nothing added, nothing artificial, no, nothing taken away. And so they're safe for any use. And it's going to be depending on the age of the individual. So proper dilution is going to be important. Now, the second really cool thing about oils is that can, they can be more effective than medication in so many instances, because a lot of medication is actually derived from nature. And the reason that oils are so effective is that they can permeate our cell membranes. We're made up of trillions of cells and a lot of medication cannot penetrate the cell to get into that nucleus. And therefore there's a lot of medication that is ineffective for a lot of issues like viruses, but essential oils can penetrate a membrane and you don't have to worry about oils building up resistance or causing these negative side effects that are very common with synthetic options. Now, the third thing is that they can be very affordable because you only use a couple of drops and each drop is a few cents. And overall, you do save tons of money versus going to the doctor and the medical costs that can just pile up. And the reason I know this is true is because I used to be a pretty sick individual I was always at the doctor. I was taking 12, 13 medications. And when I learned about natural options about six years ago, I basically just go for checkups. 80 to 90% of my health issues have been resolved naturally. And so that's why essential oils can be a natural alternative that's also very, very cost effective. Now, the three ways that we use essential oils are aromatically. So just taking the cap off your bottle and taking some deep breaths. That's an easy way. You could put it on your hand and then you rub your hands together and you can take some deep breaths. That's another way. My favorite way is to use a diffuser. And so I have one right behind me 
and you just add water and essential oils. And the way it works is that as you inhale these aromatic molecules, they go up your olfactory bulb. Your bulb is connected to a nerve that goes into the brain. And once in the brain, it triggers the limbic system of the brain. And your limbic system controls hormones, stress levels, your heart rate, your breathing rate, your memories, your mood. So just by your nose, you can balance all of those things out. So it's a very powerful way to use oils. Plus, it cleanses and purifies the air and can support your respiratory system. So if you know me, I'm going to have a diffuser going 24-7. I have them throughout my house, and I absolutely love switching up the combinations to get different support and different types of aromas. The second way you use oils is topically. So this is for your localized benefits. If your back hurts, you put some there. If you have a headache, you put some there. You want to be careful not to get it in your eyes, up your nose, in your ears, or in your private parts. So diluting is very important, and they're going to be a lot more effective if you dilute them because the carrier oil, which we frequently use, is coconut oil, the fractionated coconut oil. That one will dilute it and will avoid irritation. Plus, it also helps with the absorption and time release of the essential oil. The third way we use oils is internally. Now, not all oils are safe for internal use, and I am only speaking specifically about doTERRA. Uh, because I don't know what the safety standards are for other companies. But we do have several oils that are safe for internal use, and we put them in water, in a veggie capsule, or I directly, I put them under my tongue or on the roof of my mouth. Now, before we go into uh, the grief and the different stages of grief, I do want to give you a little bit of background on how essential oils can support our emotions. Because as I'm going through the different stages of grief, I will be sharing oils and I'm going to share some of the oils I use. But I do want to give you a sense of how oils can support us on an emotional level. So let's do a quick little uh, recap of what essential oils do for your emotional system, your nervous system. And if you want more details on everything that has to do with emotions and essential oils, I'm also going to link that class on essential emotions. That's another class in my YouTube channel that goes into a lot more detail. But let's do a quick little recap from that class. So what are emotions? These are basically caused by, by our thoughts and by our individual experiences. And people can react differently to the same situation. Just take, for instance, a person that yells at us. Some may react with anger and others may react in fear. Or a dog. If a dog is barking, some people will just be so excited to go pet the dog. And others will be absolutely terrified because they may have gotten bitten as a child by a dog. So that experience is going to color their reaction. Or if you're afraid of heights and you're at the top of a mountain, you may have vertigo and feel really dizzy and woozy. However, others may just feel excited to look at the beautiful landscape. So again, depending on what your mind is telling you, your body is going to react. And what it's doing at that moment, as it pulls from experiences, as it pulls from the memories, it starts a chemical reaction. And that's going to manifest itself physically and emotionally. So for instance, if we get nervous, our hands might get cold, our voice might get shaky, we can get butterflies in the stomach. And so these are all emotional things that are happening, resulting in a physical manifestation. And so all of this is related to the chemistry happening in the body, as well as the frequencies that are being released, that emotional energy or vibration. Everything has energy. Everything has a frequency. So let's look at a couple of examples. If you are listening to a radio station and you want to change the channel, when you change it, 
there's a different signal that's going out to get that other frequency that's being emitted by the by the station. And so these are all frequencies that are electrical and will have an impact on the results of changing that channel. The same thing happens when you have an EKG and you see those impulses on the machine. That's all electrical. Those are frequencies and vibrations. Same thing for the different tests they do for the brain to see your brain activity. All of these are frequencies. We are made of energy and we emit and transmit different impulses. So even our food, our illness, everything has a frequency. And this is very important to recognize because it's going to build upon how essential oils can support us emotionally. Now, here's a very brief overview of how emotions have been studied and the frequencies of different types of emotions. When we pass away, zero. We're not emitting any frequencies. We're not emitting any energy. But look at the lower numbers are going to be related to more negative energy, negative emotions. So if someone's really depressed or sad or blue, how do they react? Lethargic, tired, fatigued, just a really low mood because their energy is low. That emotion is low. But as you come up the scale with happier and more positive emotions, then that energy also gets elevated. Most humanity is at a 200 or below on the scale. And you'll notice that those lower numbers, again, are going to relate to negative emotions like impatience, discouragement, frustration, being angry, being jealous, having fear or rage. And we can up-level our emotions with a little bit of support. So essential oils have energy, they have frequencies, they're alive, and they can transmit some of that energy to support our emotions. And that's the connection of how essential oils can help us emotionally. Now, the oil that has the highest energy, the most frequency out of all the substances on earth is rose. It's at 320 megahertz. So I thought this was really interested. And then I've also outlined some of the research where this research was found. But I do want to share with you um, just I, we can't go into all of this in detail. These are just a lot of different oils that can support us emotionally. And I'm, I start a few that I will go into. But if you're interested in getting this sheet that outlines all the different oils and how they work, just pop me a, a message. You can put your email in the chat or your phone number. And like that, I'll know to make sure I get that over to you. But let me go over just some of the things I've been using to support my sadness and the pain that I've been feeling lately, like a lot of you as well that are with us today that are also experiencing loss. I use my doTERRA vitamins they are the best I have ever, ever found, and they are a whole food supplement. So they're made with broccoli and kale and spinach and things that our body is going to recognize. There's no artificial ingredients, no preservatives, nothing synthetic, and they're a perfectly balanced nutrition. You're not going to have those super mega dosages that can actually be harmful for the body and difficult for the body to process. So I take my vitamins without fail. And if you want to learn more about the vitamins, I have a video on that as well, but they're absolutely awesome. Then I also take a probiotic. Um, I love doTERRA's probiotic because it supports your upper GI as well as your lower intestines. And not only is a probiotic super important for your overall digestive health, but 80% of your immune system is made in the gut. 
And 90% of your neurotransmitters like serotonin, that's the chemical that makes us feel calm and happy, that's also made in the gut. So having a really good probiotic when you're not feeling great emotionally is super, super important. Um, so these are the main things I've been taking is the adaptive system by doTERRA. This system was created for emotional upheaval. When we are trying to adapt to very, very difficult circumstances and our body is kind of in chaos, not, not sure what to do, it settles all that down and just helps you feel a lot calmer and less overwhelmed and reduces those anxious feelings. So this is one of the primary things that I've been using. So I take the capsule, I use it topically, and I also use the oil in my diffuser. Copaiba, um, I always say it's better than CBD. Uh, it does not have any type of hallucinogen or that type of effect, but this is a tree that is an amazing essential oil to support your nervous system. It helps reduce anxious feelings. Uh, so instead of taking synthetic drugs for anxious feelings, I use copaiba. Uh, but the wonderful thing is that it also supports your cardiovascular system, your immune system, and your digestive health. So this is an absolute must for me. Frankincense is known as the king of oils. This is one of my all-time favorites. It is a oil that has been around for thousands of years. And I use this for my really sad, sad feelings. I have a history of struggling with sad emotions. And frankincense helps keep me balanced. Any of those mood issues that come up, uh, highs and lows, uh, frankincense is great for that, and it also protects and renews your cells. Console and peace are part of our emotional therapy kits, and console, I absolutely love console. I love the way it smells. It's a blend of various oils that are very calming to your emotions. It relieves that emotional pain or feelings of burden plus those deep wounds where you just feel like you have a broken heart. These oils are very soothing to those type of very painful, painful emotions. Finally, we have peace. And I like peace because sometimes when you're very emotional, you can feel angry. You can feel irritable and moody and impatient. And this kind of just settles those type of frequencies in the body. Uh, so remember, again, we're talking about the emotional frequencies that we're going through and how different oils can support depending on where they are in that emotional scale. So this has been my toolbox uh, in the past uh, three or four weeks, and it has been a, a wonderful support. And I just wanted to share that with you. Um, this is a picture of my dear sister, uh, Amy and I, and I found this quote that really touched me that states grief, it's not a sign of weakness, nor a lack of faith. Grief is the price of love. Isn't that true? Sometimes we can be grieving and individuals might hint that we just need to have more faith and it has nothing to do with faith it has to do with how much we miss them how much we need them and the history that has evolved throughout the years as spending a lifetime with an individual and so we're not weak because we grieve we don't like faith because we grieve we grieve because we love and that's just all there is to it so don't let anybody tell you any different. The topics we're going to be discussing today are the causes and effects of trauma and grief, the five stages of grief and how you can find natural support, a couple of self-care tips when you're grieving, and then how to support others and some practical suggestions for helping those undergoing uh, grief. Now, 
grief doesn't just happen when a loved one dies. There's a lot of different types of grief and some of the steps as far as dealing with the stages of grief we're going to talk about can also apply to other types of loss. It can apply to a divorce or a separation or if somebody is seriously ill in our family, maybe they're, they're terminally ill, we know we're going to lose them. Perhaps we ourselves are dealing with a severe illness, or you're a survivor of war or uh, emotional or sexual abuse or some type of domestic violence. Even a death of a pet can be so very traumatic, uh, not being able to have children. I know when I had my hysterectomy, I went into a very deep depression because I wasn't going to be able to have children ever. And that was very traumatic for me. And it took me a while to come to terms with that reality. And so there's a lot of different types of traumatic events that can put us on the path of, of mourning and grieving. So some of the steps we're going to go through today, just keep in mind that maybe if you haven't personally lost someone you love, you might have experienced traumatic events that would benefit from the support that I'm going to share with you. Now, the way trauma or grief can affect the body is nightmares, having insomnia, uh, being startled very easily. You can have that racing heartbeat. Uh, general aches and pains, feeling very fatigued, difficulty with any type of focusing or concentration, feeling agitated or edgy, uh, headaches, stomach ache, um, all sorts of different physical manifestations. However, if you are not treating that trauma, or if you are in a state of grief for a very extended period of time, it can affect your future health. Uh, studies have been shown that it can lead to chronic disease, such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease, autoimmune disease, and even uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So that's why going through the stages of grief is going to also support your health and negate any of the negative effects of long-term mourning. Now, I did some research and I wanted to share a quote by this therapist. She's a licensed counselor that specializes in grief. And she was stating that a lot of people don't recognize that there's just so many different aspects of grief. And when people don't feel that they have permission to feel those feelings or they just don't know how to deal with them, it can be very detrimental to their recovery. And so there's no right way to grieve. There's no wrong way to grieve. And don't ever feel like you need to apologize for being sad or for crying. Don't think about, oh, I'm going to make them uncomfortable or I don't want them to think I'm weak. When we are going through that process, it's a process of self-healing and it's a journey. And every time we lose someone, that experience is going to be different. When my mom died, it was totally different than when my dad died. And then when my sisters died. So each experience is unique and we just need to give ourselves a little bit of grace to grow, go through the process. And I hope what I share today is going to just help you understand a little bit about the different stages of grieving and mourning. Now, 53% of people in a survey indicated they felt their grief had an expiration date. Because people sometimes in our society, they're always fast paced. They always have things to do. We're just all so very busy. And so if we are in a situation where maybe we feel pressured by others to move forward and we may not even be ready and you feel like you have to meet those people expectations you don't this is your journey you're going to go at your own pace and that's the best way to heal allowing your body to move through the different stages when your body is ready to get to the next stage uh, so don't let anybody or circumstances make you feel pressured to just hurry up and, and get over it and move on. There's a 
another a study that was done uh, by WebMD ta uh, talking about the different stages of grief, and they surveyed about 1,084 people throughout the United States. And different people responded to different emotions depending on who they had lost. So they wanted to compare people that had lost a, a friendship or a really close relationship versus the loss of a loved one. And nearly half of people said that the most powerful, intense feelings, they subsided about six months after. And then others said it took about a year, about 67% said it took about a year. But the people that had lost a spouse or a partner, a parent or a child said it took about five years for those intense feelings to subside. So you can see that there is no schedule to healing. It could be months or it can be years. And just quickly, if you want to look at some of these percentages, but uh, sadness, for instance, when they lost a friendship or a relationship, about 68% reported that that was one of the greatest emotions that they were experiences, experiencing. And then the death of a loved one, about 84% said, yeah, sadness. Sadness was the main, the main emotional battle that was consuming them after the loss of someone they loved. You also have fatigue, depression, changes in appetite, anger. Uh, people were isolating. And then the severe pain of just thinking about the loss of that loved one. There's a broken heart syndrome that is very real. People have asked, can you die of a broken heart? And the answer is yes, you can die of a broken heart. Uh, a broken heart syndrome will feel very much like a heart attack. You get the chest pain, the shortness of breath, and it can happen when you go through a very emotionally stressful, traumatic event, like the death of a loved one. And so what happens is that you get this overwhelming surge of stress hormones. So it's not related to a clogged artery. It's just the hormones just overtake the body. And what they do is they can cause short-term heart failure, which can be life-threatening. And it usually occurs within minutes to hours of a traumatic event. And as these hormones surge through the body, they basically attack the heart muscle and it shocks those cells. It, it, it paralyzes a part of your heart. And that's where the symptoms of a heart attack come into play. So even though this is very unlikely, it, it is known to occur. Uh, if you know the actress, um, Debbie Reynolds, she passed away the day after her, her daughter died, uh, which play, she, I, be I believe she played Princess Leia in Star Wars. Uh, Carrie Fisher was her name. And so her daughter died. And then the next day she passed away. And they believe it was related to this broken heart syndrome. So if you or you know of someone that has these symptoms upon the news that that can be so devastating to anyone, make sure that they do go to the doctor that you can make a full recovery. The doctors will give you some medication to re reduce the stress levels in the body and that should stabilize the heart muscle. So oils you can use when someone is experiencing these very intense emotions are geranium and rose. You can use those aromatically as well as topically. Now, grief is unique. It's unique to each individual. And even though there are stages, which I'm going to outline in just a moment, not every stage happens in the same order and not everyone experiences the five stages. So the reactions of people that grieve are going to vary vastly from intensity as well as duration. And so we don't know how a person's going to react after someone they love has passed away, but you can just be assured that the range of reactions is going to vary drastically. 
The other thing is that in many cultures um, or personalities, they think that crying is a weakness or they don't want to show tears in, in public. But expressing your loss, as we're going to learn throughout the class, is so important to help you heal. It's, it's part of the process. And so there is no right way to grieve. Just remember that there's no wrong way and there's no right way. There's just your way. Now, here are the five stages of grief we're going to go through in the class. The first one is denial slash shock. The second one is anger. The third one is bargaining. The fourth one is depression. And the fifth one is acceptance. And so Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, she pioneered the study of grieving. And in 1969, she released the book on death and dying. And these are the five stages that she presented. And just to keep in mind that because everybody's experience is so unique, we want to just be cognizant of the fact that there can be extreme reactions that could be detrimental. And so if you or someone you know is considering harming themselves, please seek medical attention. And if someone is in a stage where they are really having difficulty coping and might be engaging in detrimental behavior, there are support groups and trauma groups that can be very helpful. And we're going to go into that in a little bit more detail. But just remember that we want to be realistic as to what we can and can't do and seek the appropriate support for our safety. So let's look at the very first stage is shock and denial. Nope, not true. It's a mistake. It, it didn't happen. The initial numbness and the shock of hearing those, those words or realizing that someone we love is gone, there's different forms of denial. And your habits or your memories or the way you talk about a person that has passed may not be connecting the dots that that has actually happened. And so just remember that denial is a normal part. It's, it's, a, it's a very important function of processing the grief. And it's a way that your mind protect itself. It's protecting itself from, from that extreme pain. And so it's, it's not normal not to believe, right, that your loved one has died. It's something that occurs to everyone that has experienced a loss because your mind just can't comprehend living without that person. And so denial is a form of self-preservation. Now, when we are in this stage, it's important not to avoid things that remind us of our loved one. It can be difficult and very painful, but if we avoid going into their bedroom or we avoid looking at their clothes or we avoid driving their car or just avoiding anything that has to do with that person, it's going to make it harder to get to the next stage. Uh, so as we experience the things that belong to our loved one, we're going to cry and we're going to get angry and we're going to have all of these very intense emotions, but it's a necessary part to getting through the shock and the denial as painful as it is. Or do not disguise that you are well or that everything is fine when it is not. It's okay to show our emotions and we don't have to try and be strong just so that others are not uncomfortable. It's okay to let people see us grieve. A few oils that can support us if we are in this stage of shock and denial is deep blue, vetiver, 
Kelly Chrisom, Balance, Juniper Berry, Jasmine, and Turmeric. There may be some sc screenshots that might be helpful to have if you wanted to take a picture or a screenshot so that you have some of these oils available. And I'll be sharing a couple of recipes and diffuser recipes as well later on. So just something to keep in mind. Now at the bottom of each of these stages, I have a, an affirmation or a declaration. Now, if you're not familiar with affirmations or declarations, they are a really good way to help your subconscious deal with whatever stage it's in. Because what your mind believes, your, your body's going to follow suit. And so even though you may tell yourself a declaration that you don't necessarily believe, you're putting it in your brain and giving your mind something to consider. You're inviting your subconscious to consider an alternative to being stuck in a specific stage. And so just because you say it, it doesn't mean you automatically believe it and it's automatically going to happen but you're just giving your mind an opportunity to consider the possibility of something different, something that can help you get on that road to healing. So for this one, you can say, as you use your oils, as you're putting them on, as you're inhaling them, I now trust the process of healing. I am now open to seeing the truth. Diffusing, again, very important. You can diffuse balance with, with the vetiver throughout the day uh, for this specific stage. And again, this stage can last hours, weeks, months. Everybody's different, okay? Let's go to the next stage, and this is anger. How could she leave me? How could he leave me? How could they do this to me? You could be angry with yourself, what you didn't do, what you did do. If you had an argument, if you had promised something and you didn't fulfill your promise, you're angry at yourself for not doing what you think you should have done. Maybe you're angry at the doctors or at the nurses. Maybe you're angry at your loved one because they neglected their health. There are so many different reasons why we can be angry. And so honor your anger and just realize it's natural, natural to be angry. You can go to an isolated place and just shout or scream if you need to, but let it out. Suppressing your anger again will just prolong your healing. And it is important, though, to look for healthy ways to let that anger out. And the intensity of your anger is just a sign of the intensity of your love for that person. Physical activity can be something to consider. It can help with that process of slowly letting go of the anger, something like swimming or running or participating in some type of active sport, that physical activity will help reduce some of those endorphins and adrenaline in your, in your body. The fourth thing you can consider doing is just talking to somebody. It can be a counselor. It can be someone from your congregation, family, friends. Don't, don't think that people are going to think you're crazy or that you're just too emotional, or you're being very negative. Talking it out is going to help you process the anger. A few oils to consider for anger, the cardamom, thyme, geranium, ylang ylang, spikenard, Siberian fir, forgive, HD clear, turmeric, and past tense. Again, for all of these, you can apply them topically, right bottom of your feet, the back of your neck, in your pulse points, 
And for anger, you can diffuse elangulang, forgive, and geranium. For your self-declaration, when you're using your oils, I now have permission to recognize and validate my feelings. I now trust that all things are working together for my greater good. The next stage is bargaining. They wouldn't have died if only I had fill in the blank. I know that's something that I have been going through. I think I'm in the bargaining stage where you condemn yourself because you feel you could have done something differently. And you can blame yourself for even that person dying because if you would have done X, they wouldn't have died. And this process is helping you imagine how things could have gone differently and you would be able to actually deal with the pain if, of course, there would have been a different outcome. And so your mind is just trying to rationalize ways that things could have been different. And that is, again, a normal process of grieving and serves an important function. It, it can even give you a temporary escape from the pain you're feeling, give you almost a glimmer of hope, imagining if you would have done this or you would have done that, and you start to imagine how things could have been different. So this is your brain's and your body's way of helping you adapt to the reality of the situation. It's your, your, your brain's coping mechanism to go through these different scenarios. And it can also give you a sense of control when you just feel so helpless. Those scenarios give you a little bit of control of what could have gone differently. Again, talking, you know, talking to someone you trust, someone you feel comfortable with, and letting out the different scenarios that play in your mind, that's a really good thing to do. And then when you're in this process, just reminding yourself, there's really nothing you could have done. You did the best you can under the circumstances. You did the best you can with the information you had available at the time. Everybody can look back and say, if I would have done this, if I would have done that. But life doesn't work like that. You know, we can't take certain things back. And at that time, we do the best we can with the information we have. So making peace with that is very difficult. But it is part of your bargaining stage of grieving. And being in this stage can take a while. But Again, if you recognize when you're doing this, that you are in the bargaining stage. A few oils to consider is your copaiba, uh, bergamot, lemon, peppermint, and citrus bloom. Apply a few drops to bottoms of your feet, back of your neck, your pulse points, and then you can diffuse copaiba, bergamot, and citrus bloom. Your declaration when you're using your oils I am now open to learn the truth about the situation. I am now filled with compassionate love for myself and others. The next stage is depression. What will become of me now? I don't know how to live without him, without her in my life. My life is meaningless. So this is the period when you're grieving and you're realizing the hole that they've left in your life. The immense sadness of losing that person. And there can be triggers when we're in this stage of depression. It can be the anniversary of their death. It could be their birth date. It could be a marriage anniversary. It can be just 
anniversaries of things you did together. Um, plan for these dates. Prepare in advance what you can do to get support from friends or family to just make that day just a little bit more tolerable, okay, if you plan for it. Also, don't isolate yourself. Don't avoid social situations. I know when we're depressed, that's the last thing we want is to deal with people and be around others. But that can be one of the most important things we can do for ourselves is to be around others. And if you're a 10 on the depression, maybe it'll bring you down to a nine or an eight. But doing whatever you can not to isolate yourself because that's just going to perpetuate the cycle of this extreme sadness. And then finding ways to express yourself. Be creative. Maybe you want to start writing some poems about your loved one or some letters. What would you tell them? Just getting that out can be a very therapeutic and cathartic process. Painting, uh, music, creating a song for them, just expressing how you're feeling and the process that you're going through in a creative way. And then keeping in mind that certain things can just make everything worse. So if we overindulge in alcohol or other negative habits, um, drugs or risky behavior, just keeping in mind that we're not quite ourselves at this point, And we want to be just extra gentle and extra careful with ourselves. Exercise is a really good thing to do when you're depressed. That might be the last thing you want to do. I'm telling you from personal experience that <laughs> exercise was not something I wanted to do when I was really depressed. But if you do activate some of those endorphins, it can re reduce your stress levels. And even something gentle like going for a walk or going for a hike can just give you these wonderful, uplifting qualities that you may not otherwise feel if you just stay home and have this constant state of sadness envelop you. A few oils to do to consider. Um, I actually added some of the things I'm doing for myself on this page. So Melissa, Elevation Cheer, Frankincense, Adaptive, and Neroli Touch. This is for a rollerball. So what you could do is choose two or three of these oils and then mix them in a rollerball, about five to seven drops of each. And then just fill it up with the fractionated coconut oil or other carrier oil of your choice. And you can apply this to the back of your neck, behind your ears, bottom of your feet, even over your heart. Also diffuse adaptive or any of these oils throughout the day. Internally, what I've been doing is that I put a drop of frankincense on my big thumb and then I just press it on the roof of my mouth. And I do that about three times a day. Or you can just drop it under your tongue and hold it for about 20 seconds and then swallow. I take my PB assist, my probiotic, and then I'm taking my vitamins, as I mentioned. A declaration for this stage is I now choose to move forward in joy. I now claim a happy heart. So again, you may say these things and absolutely not believe it or not even feel it but just that you're putting something positive in your brain is a step in the right direction. Now, the next stage and the final stage is acceptance, where you start to think to yourself, I'm going to move forward. That's what my loved one would have wished. Or you can say, I have to adapt. You know, I don't have a choice, I have to adapt and finding a way to reconfigure your life, your new life without that individual. And so the intensity of grief, it doesn't last forever. It will eventually someday subside. So just because you're at the acceptance stage, it doesn't mean you're totally recovered and it doesn't mean you've forgotten your loved one. It just means that little by little, step by step, 
the pain is just a little bit softer, okay? Have open and honest communication. Don't be defensive. Two, accepting what reality is with resignation, serenity, and courage. Uh, being present in the moment and adapting to your new life, uh, the new reality, doing that with compassion, with patience. And then when you've gotten to a acceptance, you've stopped fighting reality. You're not denying your new circumstances anymore. And you're no longer trapped in one of the previous stages of grief where you just feel stuck and you can't get out of that stage. So again, acceptance can take months. It can take years. But this is what it could look like. Oils for facing acceptance, rose, bergamot, ylang-ylang, spikenard, jasmine, pink pepper, and beautiful. This is another roller ball recipe, choosing two to three of these oils, mixing them in a roller ball, five to seven drops of each, and then filling it with fractionated coconut oil, back of neck, behind your ears, over your heart, bottom of your feet, morning and evening, and then diffusing ylang ylang and bergamot throughout the day. A declaration would be, I am safe and open to healing. So these are the five stages. And now I wanna give you, before we close the class, some practical suggestions as to what to say and maybe what not to say to someone that is grieving or has lost someone. It could also be someone that's experienced a, a trauma. So yes, you can say some of these things. I can't imagine how you feel. Being honest and saying, I don't know what to say. Or asking permission, is it okay if I ask what happened? I can't imagine how difficult, how traumatic, how painful this was for you. Tell me more about your sister. Tell me more about your son. Tell me more about your husband. Ask about the person that they've lost. Talking about them can help them in the process of grieving. Is there anything I can do to support you? I'm here for you. Whatever you need, you can count on my support. I'm here if you want to talk. I want to listen. So these are all good things that can help people that are just so sensitive and overwhelmed and just tear, torn apart with that inner pain. What you don't want to say is, I imagine how you feel. No, you don't. Even if you would have lost someone in death, every experience is unique. Every relationship is unique. Every set of memories is unique. So no, we don't know how they feel. And don't ever tell someone, you just have to be strong. Okay, that's the last thing they want to hear. <laughs> or they're in a better place. Or they're just asleep. Or they're in heaven now. We want them here with us right now. <laughs> we don't want them in a better place, right? So don't tell people they're in a better place. Um, in time, you'll be fine. You know, time heals all wounds. Yes, that's true, but they don't want to hear that. Um, you have to have faith in blank, whatever that person believes in. It would be worse or would have been worse if this would have happened, right? Don't do that scenario. It's already worse for that person that's grieving. You have to be strong for your children. He had a long life. Death, it's, it's part of life, right? That's very insensitive. Don't say that. Um, God works in mysterious ways. So these are just some of the things that they've, they've done surveys, extensive surveys on what helps and what doesn't. And so all of these are in the no-no category. Now, when we're talking to someone that's grieving, they just want you to listen. Okay, don't try to fix the situation. Don't try to fix them. Just listen and listen with an open heart. Listen with compassion and patience, not with your mind. Okay, and if they don't want to talk, don't pressure them. If they just want to sit there in silence, 
just sit there with them in silence. Just your company alone can be a source of comfort. And then as they're expressing their feelings, don't judge them, don't criticize them, don't analyze them, and don't offer any unsolicited advice. Other ways you can show support is to send a card or a letter, calling and just saying, I'm thinking about you or sending them a text and just listening. Consider maybe giving a donation to the family, right, if they need it, or maybe if they have a cause that is important to them, you can do a memorial donation in their, in their honor. You can offer practical support, like mowing the lawn, or maybe if someone's husband died and they're not in a state of mind to drive, maybe you can offer to drive them to their appointments or run some errands and go to the market for them, or maybe they need help with funeral arrangements, offer practical support. You can invite them to a coffee or a meal, send flowers or a plant or some type of thoughtful gift or a prepared food. And don't forget about people. They're gonna be dealing with the grief for a really, really long time. And so don't forget about them after a month or after six months, you know, you wanna check in on them and just remember that they're still grieving. Maybe we moved on after a week or after a few days because we weren't that close to that individual, but the person suffering for through that great loss is going to be going through a really hard time for a long, long time. So make sure you're there for them. Now, as we close the class, I wanted to just give you a couple of my tips for coping with grief, things that I've done that have helped me giving ourselves permission to feel. Don't let anybody tell you how you should feel. Just feel your feelings and it's okay. Express yourself with others, you know, use friends or families or guides of your faith. Don't repress your grief. Acknowledge your pain and express it. You have to let it out. It's so important. And then we have number three, paying attention to your self-care. This could be one of the first things that goes out the window. When we're grieving and we're mourning, we just don't care about ourselves. And this is very detrimental to our health and to our emotional well-being. We have to be very cognizant that this is when we should take care of ourselves the most. So if you need to take time off, take time off. Try to get your sleep. Try to eat as healthy as possible drink enough water, honor your body. If it's tired, go lie down. If you want to cry, cry, but pay attention to that self-care. We really, really need it. And then don't make any important decisions. Or if you're inspired by a spur of emotion to do something, maybe talk it through with someone you trust before you take action, just to make sure you're looking at things objectively and not being inspired by emotions that could be a little unstable. Five, learn to be present in the moment and learn to calm your mind. And this was a really hard one for me. It took me a long time to get some sense of control over my emotions, but I love to use um, a, an app that is absolutely free. It's called Calm, and there's a lot of them out there, but this one is one I personally like, and it is guided imagery that just helps regulate your breathing, helps kind of quiet down all the chatter in the brain, and just lowers that blood pressure. Uh, you can even find some like meditation or guided imagery on YouTube, but if you get into the habit of doing this at least once or twice a day, it will help stabilize some of that emotional upheaval and also help with your focus and just your overall blood pressure and sense of calm. Uh, so that's a really important one. If I had to choose one, that's one of the most important ones that has helped me. Look for meaning in life and stay busy. Uh, strengthen your faith, whatever your faith is volunteer for an organization, take a class, exercise, create art, write a book, make appointments with loved ones and family just, just to connect and have some coffee or watch a movie. Seven, 
see your doctor or professional right away if your grief doesn't improve. If you cannot move past a stage or if you're thinking of harming yourself, please seek help. And number eight, consider joining a grief or trauma group. Now, this can be a little uncomfortable for some people saying, I'm not going to air my dirty laundry with a bunch of other strangers, but this can be the best way to get some of that grief out because at times it can be uncomfortable doing it with friends or with family. So do it with strangers that are actually going through the same thing. You can get more of an objective view of what their experiences are. You can learn about your trauma and your grief in a professional yet casual and formal setting. You can make new friendships or relationships with individuals where there's common ground. Plus, you can get ongoing support that sometimes is not available if you have a private counselor or some type of private therapy. Usually it's for four weeks or six sessions. When you're in a group setting like this, it can be ongoing. So that's something to just consider. A couple of diffuser blends from Helping with a Broken Heart, which is the one I'm actually using right now in my diffuser, the bergamot, frankincense, the grapefruit, and the balance. So if you want to take a screenshot of these, and you can try them, but they all smell wonderful. And then I do some shots of essential oils. So I get one of my little shot glasses, and I have a recipe for a thought tamer. When your brain is just going and going and going and, and you just have a hard time stopping all of those thoughts because you know your your stress levels are so high you can use coriander seed roman chamomile and basil one drop of each and then put it in a little glass with two or three ounces of water and just drink it down and so i do this once maybe twice a day uh, if you feel a lot of fear and when we lose someone, it can be the fear of what's my life going to be like, feeling overwhelmed with a life alone, perhaps, or a life of that's been so turned upside down. Maybe we would travel with that person, or maybe um, we had plans to retire, or there's just so many infinite possibilities as to how fear can overtake us when we lose somebody we love. And this is a shot of essential oils you can do to just calm those neurotransmitters, right, that are, are releasing that fear signal, calm those neurotransmitters down, frankincense, green mandarin, and yarrow palm, and a couple of ounces of water. So this is the conclusion of our class. I hope that you found it helpful and that some of these tips will be useful in your process of, of grieving. And I love this quote when I found it, love begins with a smile, grows with a kiss, and ends with a tear. So remember that your feelings are unique, your experience is unique, and you just want to acknowledge whatever stage you're in, it's okay. And if you need support, or if you have any questions, I'm here for you, and feel free to reach out. Now, remember that if you are part of our doTERRA family, if you have your account and you're using your oils, um, part of your membership includes a wellness consult. If you haven't had one, a wellness consult is time where we set aside to go through your protocols, depending on what is going on with your health, physically or emotionally. And we make recommendations that are customized just for you. We also teach you and answer questions about essential oils, how to dilute them, how to make a roller ball, how to use your, your diffuser. And so this is all absolutely free. So reach out to the person that enrolled you 
and they would be more than happy to answer any questions, set aside some time to be with you and support you. We do this because we're passionate about helping others. We're passionate about wellness and using natural solutions is a safe, economic and very natural way to support our overall wellness and health. Now, I want to just thank you all for joining me. I know we're all so busy and you set aside an hour of your time to, to be with me and to learn a little bit about this topic. I invite you to follow me on Instagram under The Essential Pearl. If you are part of my community, The Essential Pearl group or team, then I have a private Facebook group. Some of you are watching this class in this group today and that's for members only but you can also follow me on YouTube under The Essential Pearl. If you like this video and if you wanna get more content, you can click the notification bell. So when I do upload this video and others, then I can make sure that you get that video in your inbox. So again, if you wanted that list that outlined the top oils for emotional support for grieving and trauma, Make sure that you drop your email or your phone number in the chat box so that I can get that PDF to you as soon as possible. Thank you once again for joining me and I look forward to seeing you all in the future. Bye-bye.